So uh, the last day we started working our way through talking about the component model in, in more detail. And we finished up talking about the role of hooks in the React programming model. So they're really central to, um, to how you uh, develop in React. And they've only been around, as I said, for a couple of years, but they, they've actually made the programming model much easier. Previously, we had to implement components in classes, uh, JavaScript classes, and we had to use a lot of inheritance tricks to achieve the same um, outcome as hooks do for us. So it is a programming model, but there's a bit of magic going on behind the hooks, admittedly, and we have to have some appreciation of that. Um, okay, so the, the slides that we're looking at are these. And uh, there are two hooks that we started looking at the last day. One hook is called the new state hook, and it allows us to declare state variables. Now, I haven't told you, how do you come up with the state variables for a component? I, I will leave that to a later lecture, but essentially it is any user input uh, on the screen uh, will have an associated state variable and there are kind of basic rules in as to which component should uh, host that state variable. That's kind of for 90% of the case, that's where state uh, is reflected in your, in your React code. Now we also use a state variable the last day for storing the data that we retrieved from, from a web API. So, uh, we started talking about, as I flick my way through, it's up here. And it retrieves a 10 user profiles, if you remember, from the random user web API. And we had this text box then, which is a user input. And whenever the user typed into the text box, we wanted the list of user profiles to be filtered on that basis. This was the design I came up with. And like I said to you the last day, don't worry about how did you come up with the design, just accept it and, and uh, just understand it. And by understanding, I really mean we need to understand how this component plays a key role in the running of the app. This component was stateful. Uh, and I suppose if I flip back to the code, just to remind you, uh, this is the component at the top of the hierarchy. And indeed, it has two state variables, one for holding the current contents of the text box and the other one for holding the list of uh, user profiles returned by the web API. The second hook we talked about was the use effect hook. And you use the use effect hook when you want a component to access something outside of its scope, change something outside of its scope, or uh, subscribe to, to some event outside of its scope. Okay. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, you would uh, you probably would only use the use effect hook to make a web API call, which is what we are using it for here. So that's a classic example of uh, trying of, of this notion of side effect where you want to program a side effect within a component. So we are making a web API call, which we understand. And that fetch is triggering a state change whenever the data comes back. And we know now that uh, that whenever a state change occurs, the component re-renders. In other words, the component function re-executes from beginning to end again. The other key part of this app from a kind of dynamics point of view was the text box 
Textbox has a, an on-change event listener. And the on-change event listener was this guy here. And it also triggered a state change because we're changing the text box. So, and one of our state variables is holding the value of the text box. So we need to update that state variable. Now, whenever the component re-renders, uh, it is going to recompute the list of matching friends, which is what happens here. And it's that list of matching friends. And I'm going back over stuff from the last day now. It's that list of matching friends that you pass down to this component and it takes care of rendering them. Now, where I'll pick up the story is, uh, so I've got a console.log here inside the use effect. And I've also got a console.log here uh, inside my kind of uh, my component, which I'm calling the friends app component, even though, oh yeah, I've called the component friends app. So you might expect that when I run my application and I open up the developer tools, you might expect I'll see that console.log first, and then I will see this console.log, but that's not what actually happens. So it turns out that the use effect runs at the end of a components mount process. We talked about mounting and unmounting components. It's when a component is effectively kind of contributing uh, nodes to the browser DOM. Um, so if, a, if you've got a component that has a use effect hook within it, then as I'm just saying here now, the actual code in the use effect hook will, will run after the component has mounted, which means after the component has rendered for the first time. Now for our friends app component, that must mean that the component is rendering even though we haven't retrieved any data yet from the web API. And you've, uh, as a developer, you've got to be aware of that. And so you've got to write your component such that it could, it, it will render before data is actually available. Now, the way I took care of that in this particular little sample app was the state variable that's holding the array of user profiles, I initialized that to an empty array. And that meant then that when I wanted to filter that empty array, I just got as the output an empty array. And I passed that empty array down to the subordinate component that was concerned with rendering a list of friends. So nothing will crash. So what actually happens, even though you don't see it, is the app uh, displays initially, and by initially, what would, what would happen is uh, just the header and the text box would, would display, and there would be nothing down here. And then the app would render a second time where the list of friends, but it happens so quickly that we don't actually see it. Like if I do a manual refresh, we can't see it. You can actually simulate it. Uh, if you open up the developer tools and select the network tab, you can simulate a slow network by selecting uh, here, slow 3G. Now, if I do a manual refresh, you'll notice that you, you will see two renderings, hopefully. So we get the first render and then the second render. Okay, so that's kind of proving, what is that proving to us? That's proving, uh, well, that it is rendering more than once, but it also is proving that the use effect hook executes much later than, um, well, there, there isn't data available to us initially for the initial rendering. Let's head back to no throttling. Further proof of it though is, uh, is what I'm showing you here. So I've opened up the developer tools so that I can see the console.logs happening uh, in the browser. And so the way I can explain what's happening here now is this console.log 
comes from the friends app component itself when it rendered for the first time. Then this comes out dot log is coming from the use effect hook. So that's proving to me is running after the component has rendered for the first time. Why does the friends app component render again? Well, uh, it renders again when the API data eventually comes back from the random user uh, web API. And we know that the use effect hook triggers a state change. And because it triggered a state change, that caused my component to re-render the top component to re-render again, which is why I'm getting this console.log happening. Then the user types something into the text box. That's also triggering a state change, which is why my, my friend's app component is rendering yet again. So you need to uh, you know, appreciate what's happening there behind the scenes. And you can play around with the app yourself to simulate what I'm just showing you there. So the lesson is you must uh, you must allow for the well in this case the use effect hook um, is performing an asynchronous task which is making the web API call it doesn't always have to be asynchronous the use effect hook uh, um, well, its callback doesn't always have to perform some asynchronous task task but it does in this case uh, and so I'm saying that we we must allow for that in our component implementation and what we don't want is like obviously we don't want the browser to be frozen uh, waiting for the API data to come back because if the browser freezes, then the user can't interact with it while we're waiting for the data. And maybe they do want to, maybe they want to click something, select something. Um, so that's not an option. Uh, and secondly, as I said before, we must allow components to render uh, potentially, even though the data that they depend on isn't available yet. Now, the way I took care of that, as I said, was I initialized, if I go to the code, I'm kind of repeating myself now, but I initialized this state variable, which is the one that holds the set of user APIs to an empty array. And that would not cause any problems when this executes here, when we try to filter over the empty array. That's, you know, it's legitimate. If I just said, look, I'll just set the initial value to null. So what difference does it make? Null, empty array. But if I save that, go back to my browser, um, it's now crashing. Okay, so, and that's because I'm trying to invoke filter on the null uh, primitive, and that's... Uh, that's not a legitimate JavaScript uh, task. So that's that. Um, I've also put console.logs in the other two components, the friend component and the filtered friends component. Uh, you can see them in the code yourself. I disabled them uh, for the previous slide, but I've enabled them now. And so now we can see if we, let's assume we were requesting six. And the reason I picked six is so that I could fit this on the screen. Let's supposing I'm requesting six uh, user profiles from the random user web API. Uh, here's the sequence that happens, right? So again, the friends app component, the one at the very top, it renders initially. There's no data yet though. It does call the filtered friends component, the one uh, it's immediate subordinate. It passes down an empty array. Uh, uh, and so that, that second component does render, but it doesn't display anything because it just receives an empty array. So there's no friend components being rendered yet. Eventually my fetch, uh, my use effect runs. So in fact, the use effect runs after this component and all of its subordinates have rendered. Okay, You might think this should appear here. No, it appears because really the, the rendering of the friends app incorporates the rendering of all its subordinates. There's only one subordinate in this case. Anyway, the, the use effect runs. It makes the request for the data. Eventually the data comes back, which is why this uh, rendering happens. Now I've got uh, six friends that have been returned. So uh, when we filter over those, the, the full six 
uh, are produced because there's nothing in the text box yet, yet so they all match up. So I pass the array of six uh, user profiles down to my filtered friends list. It maps over them and causes the rendering of a friend component for each one. Then the user types something into the text box. That causes a state change in the top component. So that component renders again. Uh, it computes a new matching list of friends, which is something less, more than likely. It pass, passes that new list of matching friends down to the, the filtered friends component. And now it generates a friend for the list of matching friends. So between, so what there are, there are four friends here that match up, whereas there were six up here. So the two that are not, the two friend components that are not rendering down here, we would say that those components are unmounted from the DOM. So they don't appear, but that's really what actually happens. They are unmounted. Uh, the user types something else into the text box. Top component re-renders, computes the new list of matching friends, passes it down, and now only two friends are rendered. So all of this is what's happening behind the scenes. And you need to just appreciate that. Now, um, this is where I kind of ended in a lecture last year. So it's not ending in a lecture this year. But I've got a second set of slides, uh, which I put up uh, yesterday, which is this set of slides here. So we'll continue on. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm still dealing with hooks and component lifecycle. I suppose you could, you know, what I was explaining there a moment ago is essentially the lifecycle that's going on behind the scenes in my app in terms of components rendering and mounting and unmounting. So what I did was I added in another layer of complication, but it's the, the, the principles, the first principles are still the same. So once you grasp the first principles, hopefully uh, by just looking at a slightly more complex application, it, it won't show you. But so what I did was um, I added in two additional features to my friends app, uh, my filtered friends uh, application. I have a reset button here. And when the user clicks the reset button, I want my app to make a fresh request to the random user web API for 10 more friends. And I, I just overwrite the current list of friends with the new list that have been returned. I don't append them on for no particular reason. Okay, I just decided that's the way I was going to work it. And the second thing that, uh, the second addition that I made to my app was, I wanted to write into the browser's tab, the number of matching friends that are currently being displayed. So clearly this is another example of a side effect up here. The, 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 the button is a user input, the user can click on it. So we're gonna have a state variable a kind of uh, corresponding to that. Okay, um, I'll show you the code in a second. I've stuck with the exact same design. Uh, so we don't need to go over that. However, there are now three state variables in this component here. The two that we already know of, and I have an additional state variable corresponding to my button. And really all that state variable is going to do is it's going to oscillate between true and false. So it's just going to be a Boolean. Uh, let's say we set it to true initially. When the user clicks on the button, it goes to false. When the user clicks on the button again, it goes back to true. Clicks on it again, it goes to false. So whenever the that third state variable changes from either false to true or true to false, we want something to happen. Uh, and in terms of side effects, we have the side effect uh, that we had already. Uh, but the second side effect is going to be writing 
uh, something into the browser's tab. Uh, now, the way the way you get this version of the application to run is if you go into the it's the same code base now. If you go into the index, you can see here I've got an app two dot js. If I go into my index.js and I change the import here from app to app2 and save it. And so as I click the button, you can see my full list of friends keep changing. And also, you can see it now here in the top right here here's my browser tab and it's displaying the list the the number of matching friends so it's 10 because i've entered anything into the text box but if i change it to t you can see in the top right there it has changed it to the number of matches now um there's no new code. Uh, there's no new features, sorry, in the code. There's obviously new code, but there's no new features as such. Uh, but if we just glance through it. So, you know, here's my third state variable. And here's the, where do I put it? Um, here's the use effect that changes the browser's tab now you know it's just um, that line there is just old-fashioned uh old-fashioned dom api coding but that's 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 how you would code it the interesting thing though is uh, the use effect hook it takes a callback as the first argument and it takes what's the call what's called a dependency array as the second argument, which I haven't kind of really talked about much so far. The dependency array. So for the first use effect hook, the dependency, well, sorry, for the previous application, the dependency array was the empty array. If I go back to here, you can see here, look, the dependency array was empty. What that meant was are the, the, the yeah what that meant was that this use effect is only going to execute when the component mounts and never again if it happened to unmount and remount it would execute on the remount as well uh, but that's that's it whereas if you do have a dependency array if it has entries in it well what do they mean what they mean is so this is actually referring to it has to be referring to one of my state variables but it doesn't have to be a state variable it means that this use effect hook is going to execute at mount time and whenever this variable changes value and if you're following with me now so it's referring to this state variable here what would cause that to change value? It's when I click the button. So if I scroll down and find my button, you can see there's an on click event handler. And the on click event handler is, where did I put it? Oh, well, I've kind of, I've actually, uh, you can, if the on click event handler is really a one liner, which it is in this case, you can actually embed it within the uh, within the button. It's probably being a little bit too clever on my part now, but uh, so what does the event handler do? It it calls the setter method for my uh, state variable above, and it just simply takes the current value, current boolean value, and toggles it. But in terms of the use effect hook and this dependency array, as I've said, by having an actual entry in the dependency array, and it's an array, so there could be more than one uh, variable in that uh, in that array, uh, 
And if any one of them changes, that, that is what would trigger the execution of the use effect callback. So whenever the user clicks the button, that causes the state change, which causes this variable to change value, which means I go away and fetch another set of uh, user profiles. The second use effect hook, the one that writes the browser tab, its dependency array is actually referring to the list of uh, the array of matching friends that has been computed and it's just interested in the length of that array. If that has changed since the previous rendering, then write something new to the browser tab. So the entries in the, depend in the dependency array can be any type of variable. It could be a prop, it could be a state variable, it could be some ordinary variable that's computed within the component. And it's the latter case in this particular example. So um, what I've done in this in this slide is to try and <laughs> uh, demonstrate what's happening behind the scenes in terms of components rendering and re-rendering. Uh, so if I take it from the top, and it's really the it's the friends app component is the one we're only interested in now. We're we're not friend, interested in the subordinate ones. They're rendering as well and re-rendering behind the scenes. But so the friends app component renders for the first time. Uh, the use effect hook that makes the API call executes because that executes at mount every use effect executes at mount time. So it goes away and makes the API call. The use effect hook that writes to the browser tab executes as well. So it's going to write zero matches because we don't have any data yet. Eventually, the API data comes back and we make a state change. So my friend's app component renders again. We now have 10 friends and nothing entered in the text box. So the, uh, the size. It, sorry, this component computes the size of my list of matching friends, which is going to be 10. It was zero. So the length of my array of matching friends has changed, which is why the use effect that writes to the browser tab executes. And that's that. Nothing happens after that until the user interacts. The first thing the user does in this case is uh, they type something into the text box. We've kind of seen what happens a lot before. Typing something in the text box changes one of my state variables. Friends app component renders again. And it computes the list of matching friends, which let's say it's something different from what it was. It was 10. It's definitely going to be different. It could be zero uh, or some other value. But the size of the matching friends array has changed. And that is what is in the dependency array for the use effect hook that writes to the browser tab. So that use effect hook executes and updates the browser tab. Then let's say the user hits the reset button. Hitting the reset button causes another state change in my third state variable. Friends app component executes. That state variable that has changed was in the dependency array for the use effect hook that makes the API call. So it executes. And eventually the data comes back. When the data comes back, we make a state change. So this executes. It computes the list of matching friends, which is going to be a different size again. So the effect hook that updates the browser tab executes. Now, if you can follow that and you can rationalize all of that in your head, then you've grasped the use state and use effect hooks and it really doesn't get any more complicated than that. And you would have to do that in your own time. So here in kind of uh, 
text, I am explaining all of the kind of events that occur. What events occur at mount time? What events occur when the user types something into the text box? And what event occurs when the user clicks the reset button? So you can read through that yourself, but I've, I've tried to talk my way through it on the previous slide. Now, uh, earlier, or as in the previous lecture, I said that the only data flow pattern that is supported within a React app is the unidirectional data flow, which is props can only go in a downward direction, uh, and that's still the case. There is a second, okay, we're going to call it a data flow pattern, but it's, it's slightly misleading, but the pattern is still extremely important, and it's one that we see a lot, and it's called the data down action up pattern. Now, um, it's also called the inverse data flow pattern, a name I don't like. I prefer the data down action up because it's, it's more indicative of uh, what it's trying to describe. So where this data down action up pattern is used is when you've got, if you can visualize this, you've got a stateful component, but it's a subordinate component that actually knows when the state should change. It's not the stateful component itself. Or put it another way, the event, the browser event that happens that which would trigger a state change that browser event is associated with uh, a subordinate component, subordinate to the stateful component. And if you've got that scenario, then you need to implement this data down action up pattern. So to demonstrate it, let's supposing I change my filtered friends uh, design to be like what you see on the left. So I've created a new component called search box. And really all that component is concerned with is managing the text box. And this is actually a better design than the previous design, arguably. The problem now though, is that this component here is still the only stateful one. And this is the component that has the state variable which is going to hold the current value of the text box. However, the, the user entering something on the text box is going to be picked up by this component here. So it needs to tell the stateful one, you need to change your state variable. And of course, the same thing, you know, when the state variable changes, this goes through a re-rendering and, and, and all that, which we don't need to go into. So how do we solve that problem? And what you do is um, what the, the stateful component is going to have a function that will implement the state change, but it actually passes a reference to that function as a prop down to the subordinate component. So it turns out now that props are not just transmitters of data. They can receive functions as well as their value. Uh, so the stateful component, so if I go back to the previous screen, this one here is going to have a function that, and it'll just be a one-liner, and the one-liner will be to change the current value of the state variable, but it's going to pass a reference to that function as a prop down to this one. And the event handler in this component is just going to call the function that exists up here. So here's the code. Now I've I've scaled back this application. There's no reset button. There's no updating a browser tab event or anything like that. It's the simplest version of the application. And here is the function that is going to uh, that's going to execute the state change. Okay, so it's just calling the setter method of my state variable up here. Uh, this one up here. So that's fine. Uh, and this function is passed the current value of the text box. But you can see that I'm actually passing that function down as a prop 
to my subordinate component. My subordinate component is the search box component, the new one. Passing it down as a prop to it. It's the only prop in this case. That's just coincidental. Here's the search box component. Uh, very little in it, but so it has the text box. It has the event handler. It has an event handler. Uh, sorry, where, yeah, here's my text box. It has an event handler. Here's the event handler here. And what does the event handler do? It actually calls the prop that was passed down to it. It calls that function, passing it the current value of the text box. This stuff here is just how you extract. Again, this is kind of old DOM API code. Uh, I know I'm just pulling it out of there, but uh, you know th th that's it. That's how you extract the, the value of the text box to explain it, I suppose. The event, when the user enters on the text box, the browser creates an event object. That event object is automatically available to our event handler, whether you want to use it or not. In this case, we do. And that event object, if you navigate into this part of it, target that value, you get the, the value of the text box. Hmm. Uh, so we take that value and we pass it as a parameter to the function that was passed down to me, which means it's essentially calling that. So where the name data down action up comes from is data is always flowing in a downward direction, but actions can go in an upward direction. And if you like, this is an action that's going from the subordinate component search box up to its superordinate component, which is the friends app component. Now the code for this, which I'm not going to step through because uh, you can look at it yourself, but the code for this is in the same archive as, sorry now, uh, it's in this archive as well. And when you unzip that archive, just close these off. Uh, you get uh, when you you get this, and when you go into it, there are two apps as I said the last day. This is the one that has the the new design that I'm looking at, uh, and you can do npm install and look at the code. The only difference in the code is what I've shown you on the slides. The friends app and the friend component are the exact same as before, and there's no reset button or browser tab uh, manipulation going on in this one. So that's that. Um, the last thing I want to talk about today, where am I on time? For once, I'm ahead of time. But um, the last thing I want to talk about is something called the virtual DOM. Now, we know what the DOM is uh, from a few weeks back. It's this data structure uh, that's always been in the browser, way, way back to the days of the static web. And we know what its, its role is. Uh, now, the thing is, though, that in the early days of dynamic web apps, it was up to the developer to be aware of uh, how they should manipulate the DOM data structure. And over time, there were good practices and bad practices associated with DOM manipulation. And if, as a developer, you weren't aware of what was good practice and bad practice, then it would affect it could affect the performance of your app. By performance, I mean, you know, there'd be latency in how the UI changed as the user interacted with the, uh, with the app. So, you know, the developers had to build up knowledge and I'm just mentioning some of the things here, like, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't manipulate DOM nodes when they're currently attached to the DOM. You should detach them, manipulate them, and then reattach them and lots of other things as well. So, like I said, it was up to developers to actually uh, acquire that knowledge. And so what the React design team kind of asked themselves was, should we still leave that responsibility on the developer's shoulders? And 
they decided no, that they should try and somehow incorporate good practices into the React runtime engine itself and relieve the developer of any of that uh, responsibility. And so the mechanism that they came up with to achieve that was something called the virtual DOM. And what the virtual DOM is, is a much more lightweight and efficient data structure mirror of the, the real DOM, the real DOM being what the browser actually maintains. So the browser maintains the real DOM, the React engine maintains a copy of that, but it's a much more efficient copy called the virtual DOM. And so this is kind of how a React works kind of behind the scenes. So you go in, write components, and you, you have a component hierarchy. And as we were talking about there, components are rendering and re-rendering. Whenever components render and re-render or mount and unmount, what's actually happening is the virtual DOM react the react engine is updating the virtual DOM structure to reflect uh, the changes that are happening in your code so initially what it does is it creates uh, it creates an, an initial version of the virtual DOM so when the app loads into the browser initially it has to let the uh, it has to let the browser create the initial DOM structure and once that's created then React steps in and makes a copy of it, which we call the virtual DOM data structure. Then your code, your React code, is changing that virtual DOM structure, or the React engine is changing it on your behalf. And so now, what every time the app goes through a re-rendering phase, what it will do is it will make a copy of the virtual DOM make the necessary changes to the copy of the virtual DOM based on what components have changed and what new components have mounted and what components have unmounted. So it now has two copies of the virtual DOM, the new one and the previous one. It then carries out a diff operation between the new one and the previous one. That diffing operation will tell it what changes actually have to be carried out on the real DOM. And then it will do a batch update on the real DOM. And as before, once the real DOM is changed, then the browser kicks in and reflects that change on the screen. You could quite happily, and I do, <laughs> uh, program in React and not really care about the virtual DOM. I'm just making you aware of this is what is happening behind the scenes. And you may get error messages every now and again referring to something called the virtual DOM, or you may read an article uh, about it, or it comes up in an article about React. So that's kind of uh, where it's coming from. Now, there are newer generations of single page app frameworks which have discarded the virtual DOM idea. It was a dominant idea for a number of years, and a number of frameworks copied it. Now there are actually a generation that are discarding it, but we'll see how things turn out. It's all about A, making, you see the, 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 the consequence of this virtual DOM existing is our programming model is much simpler than it would be if we actually had to program the real DOM manipulation ourselves. That's, that's one of the reasons behind it. The other reasons behind it was that it would make, uh, your your app performance better. And so, you know, if we go back to our simple little counter example, if you remember, we had a button, we clicked on the button and it updated a counter. So this is what's happening really behind the scenes. Like the user clicks the button, the button had an on-click handler, uh, the on-click event handler executed. That's the on-click event handler, if you remember, uh, cause the state change, so the component state changes. And then this is what React does behind the scenes. It now kind of re-executes the, the component. That re-execution is going to make a change to the virtual DOM. It then does a diff between the new virtual DOM and the previous one, as I kind of said. 
and it batch updates the the real DOM. Or if we take the application that we've been looking at there, the one that with the text box, you know, this is a more uh, detailed explanation as to what's happening behind the scenes. So the user enters something on the text box. The text box had an event handler associated with it. The event handler triggered a state change. And so again, React re-renders the friends app component. It re-renders any children of the friends app component and any grandchildren, if you like, and keeps on going. So once it has re-rendered the friends app component and all of its children, which is essentially the entire app, everything is re-rendered now. So it now has a fully updated virtual DOM and it, uh, what am I saying here? React re-renders, okay, that's all right. Uh, it then goes into what in React terms we call the pre-commit phase. This is where it determines what changes need to be made to the real DOM. It then commits those changes to the real DOM, which in React terminology is called the commit phase. And that's React uh, done at that stage. It has done its job. It has updated the, the, the real DOM. Then the browser does this part as before, just uh, goes through its re-flow re phase and its paint phase, if you remember. Okay, um, I'm not gonna talk over this slide, it's just summarizing, but it's all about uh, hooks, uh, use state and use effect. There are a few other hooks that we will look at a little bit later on. Arguably the use state and use effect are the trickiest one to kind of get your head around and they are core to React and how it works. So if I were you, I would strongly recommend that you spend a bit of time playing with the first of the two apps that I've uh, talked my way through there. You know, enable all of the console.logs that I've put into the code and, you know, try to simulate the screenshots that I showed you and all the re-renderings that are happening as you interact with it and get a full understanding of what's happening behind the scenes. That would be very worthwhile uh, because that will help you later on in any kind of debugging that you may need to do. Right, so surprisingly, I'm finished kind of slightly ahead of time. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. I'm sure you've got questions, but you may prefer to leave them for the lab or if you want to ask them now, feel free to uh, do so. No. All right, uh, I'll let you go in that case and I'll talk to some of you tomorrow in the in the lab. Bye for now.